This morning we have uh, Ms. Maggie Brooks, who is the executive, the county executive of Monroe County. Uh, Jolene Bender, the town supervisor for Marion, New York. And last but certainly not least, Sheriff Barry Virts, and he is the sheriff of Wayne's County, Wayne County. Welcome to all of you and thank you for being here. As is uh, the rule of the oversight committee, that we will swear you in, would you please stand? Please raise your right hand. Do you swell, solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please let the record reflect that all witnesses answered the affirmative. Thank you. We are very pleased to have you here this morning um, to conclude our third panel of testimony regarding how the government, the federal government, with its uh, whole host of regulations gets in the way of success. We've heard from industries, both small businesses as well as the agricultural industry, and now it's our pleasure to welcome all of you to speak about municipalities and what the federal government is doing to impede your success as, as well as affect the cost of doing businesses in uh, your municipalities and in the county. So with that, I will start with uh, Ms. Bender. Thank you. Uh, greetings, Congresswoman Merkel, members of the Committee on Oversight, Government, and Reform, and guests. My name is Jolene Bender, Supervisor, Town of Marion in Wayne County. I appreciate the opportunity to highlight some of the regulatory changes placed upon town and local government by Washington. I would like to state that it is my belief that local government is the government closest to the people. The key to our success at the local level is the expansion of improvements to water lines, wastewater treatment, and highway infrastructure improvements. I appreciate your support, which allows local municipalities to build on their existing infrastructure. We cannot build on the opportunity to create jobs or enhance the movement of persons into our, the movement of persons into our communities without improvements to our basic infrastructure. Some of the issues that I've faced with regards to water district expansion and extension are often co-funding by one more than one funding agency is necessary to make the project affordable. However, the funding agencies do not seem to work together to facilitate the co-funding. Each agency has a different requirements for their application packages. Consequently, municipalities are forced to prepare and submit separate application packages to each agency, which unreasonably adds costs and prolongs the application process. Next, each agency interprets the National Environmental Policy Act, the NEPA, program requirements differently. Consequently, each agency requires separate NEPA reviews, which differ from each other. Rather than confusion, these funding agencies should, if possible, accept one NEPA standard for all sources of federal funding. Why you can't have one simple standard that all why can't you have one simple standard that all federal agencies can share and adhere to? Federal funding agencies often require the commitment of other funding agencies for a co-funded project. But when a town does not have that seed money to make a commitment before it is funded, that makes it difficult to obtain funding commitment from other agencies. No one wants to be the first to make a commitment towards a project. Funding agencies change their applications requirement frequently, and their requests for information needed to be submitted. They often make those changes midstream and worse after a municipality has already submitted its application or is in the process of trying to prepare one. Frequent changes that lead to extreme confusion and contribute to the delay because the municipalities have to scramble to assemble all those additional documents and all that new information required to satisfy those re revised requirements. For instance, one recent change that was created, a lot of extra work and that delayed one application was the requirement that towns must now provide con consumption figures and a head count of residential and non-residential units within the town's existing water and sewer districts before we could be considered for funding. I expect that this helps to show the justification for the money to be spent, but the requirement is just too difficult. Rural development has also made a recent change in the procedures. It has eliminated the agency's pre-eligibility pre determination, the PED, in the funding package estimate, which the agency would offer when the full, full application was submitted. This makes it difficult or even impossible for towns to establish water districts when they require the New York State Comptroller's approval. The State Comptroller's Office will not take into consideration, consideration potential funding from rural development unless that agency provides an upfront written estimate of its funding package. As a result, the st State Comptroller will not approve the formation of those water or sewer districts. And this, hinders the, this situation hinders the municipalities in their attempts to create water district, and it al also prevents them from get garnering bonus points for the project's re 
readiness, which can improve the competitiveness of the project and improves the chances of that project being funded sooner. For me personally, my town of Marion has a wastewater treatment plant problem. The EPA, EPA and the DEC are moving towards stricter limits on discharge water quality, which may force us to build a new wastewater treatment plant. All indications are that they will increase dis dis discharge requirements upon small rural communities, those with 500 users or less, like Marion, and discharge them to existing streams of 125,000 gallons a day. This will result in a, dra a drastic increase in cost or, of compliance, with compliance, which then has to be passed on to my community as user fees, which they can't afford. The town of Marion is one such community where increased user fees would result in renovating, upgrading, and replacing, replacing existing wastewater treatment facilities to meet those higher dis discharge standards and requirements. However, those higher standards do not seem to be required nor justified. It would be more prudent to study the present impact on the existing water qualities prior to discharge and at, after the discharge. To determine if water quality is actually being adversely affected by the discharge, if water quality is not being as adversely affected, is operated, then the burden placed upon the small communities to meet the unnecessary stricter limits appears to be unreasonable, especially during these more difficult economic times. While it is important to strive for and achieve high water quality, it is also important to consider that if stricter limits, once imposed, merely result in a hardship to my local community without a substantial impact upon the water quality discharged to the local waterway, then why should we do it? And in closing, I would anything that you can do to address the above type of issues and concerns, and which would assist Marion in, to increase its efficiency and effective, effectiveness would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. County Executive Brooks. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity, and certainly there's no issue of greater importance to all of us in government than to strengthen and uh, strengthen the local economy and to be able to create jobs. It's certainly our priority. Although government doesn't create jobs, um, we are certainly at the table uh, working tirelessly to foster the environment that increases economic development opportunities and certainly allows businesses um, to grow and expand and create jobs in the private sector. Um, there are a number of things that we do locally by maintaining a stable tax rate, providing affordable financing and incentives through our industrial development agency. Um, Monroe County is certainly at the table each and every day to assist businesses to improve and expand their operations locally. Despite this um, activity at the local level, there are a number of federal regulations that when coupled with the cost of unfunded mandates, and you hear us talk about that all the time, has led to enormously high property taxes that have threatened our economic prosperity by driving businesses, jobs, and young talent away from our state in search of greater opportunities elsewhere. Um, certain federal regulations have grown increasingly detrimental to the small to mid-sized companies that have become this region's economic bread and butter. For example, the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act of 2006 and 2008 hinders small businesses looking to become subcontractors on large federal contracts because it's not cost effective for them. Federal reporting requirements are the same for a prime contractor who has a multi-million dollar contract as it is for a small contractor who's doing $25,000 worth of the work. These reporting requirements for small businesses include salaries and bonuses of officers, pension values, specifics on compensation in excess of $10,000. This rule highly discourages small business from bidding and securing subcontracts on federal projects as the cost of monitoring and reporting outweighs the profit. Another impediment to local economic development in Monroe County is a requirement under the U.S. Small Business Administration 504 program. The 504 program is widely used in this community. It requires that one job be created for every $65,000 in federal funds borrowed. The amount should be increased to one job for every $100,000 borrowed to allow businesses to focus on investing in the new technology required to remain competitive in a global economy. Oftentimes in government, too much emphasis is placed on a company's headcount. What often gets neglected is a company's investment in the economy. Investing in capital equipment is often a great indicator of positive economic growth. 
Federal regulations can also indirectly impact local economic development efforts by forcing counties to pick up the costs of unfunded mandates, leaving little left over for economic development initiatives that put people to work and strengthen the economy. One example is New York State changing their interpretation of a current federal regulation. The state's new interpretation requires transportation departments to obtain temporary easements for rights of way instead of a grading release. In the past, these projects only required a grading release, which is in essence an unofficial handshake for use of a property, um, and only required a grading release that was inexpensive yet effective. The new requirement adds thousands of dollars in cost to project totals and prohibits construction from moving forward in an efficient manner. It's critical that New York State utilize the original requirements for right-of-way acquisition so costs are not eventually shifted to taxpayers or back to the state and federal governments who often pay a portion of a county's transportation project costs. Another transportation regulation on the federal level that's impacting counties is the requirement to replace all street signs with new higher visibility road signs. Monroe County has estimated that this new federal mandate will cost about $3 million in this community alone. A new federal environmental services regulation will soon change the way counties are required also to clean up stormwater runoff with no long-term funding source to do so. This new regulation has the potential to add significant cost to the planning, design, and construction of new economic development. When we get into the question and answer phase, I do have three people who are here with me, Mike Garland from our Environmental Services Department, I'm Judy Seiler, our Economic Development Director, and Terry Rice, our Transportation Director, because they are the detailed people. Um, in closing, I will just mention one other thing that we discovered uh, in a very real way during um, the distribution of um, the stimulus monies. A lot of counties like ours were unable to apply those dollars because the requirements needed to take a property from idea to shovel ready status made it impossible for us to ever have a project ready to receive stimulus funds that were designed to create jobs. And so certainly when you talk about environmental regulations um, and some of the permitting processes um, that local governments have to go through to make sites shovel ready. It's an impediment to us being able to help business on the local level. And Medicaid is my final word. I don't have to say anything about Medicaid today. You know that that is the cost driver of property taxes, um, mainly in New York State. So that, that's a whole different uh, testimony. But thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you very much, Sharon Kurtz. Representative Burkle. Uh, Representative Kelly, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before your subcommittee on regulatory affairs, stimulus oversight, and government spending. My topic is the Prison Rape Elimination Act, PREA. Several years ago, Congress passed the Prison Rape Elimination Act, PREA. I am sure everyone is in favor of eliminating rape in prisons, but I am not sure that PREA will accomplish that. What I am sure it will do is add huge costs to the operation of county jails around the country. The act did not spell out how prison rape was going to be eliminated, but left it to the Attorney General of the United States to specify regula regulations that would accomplish it. The Attorney General proposed standards implementing PREA were published on the Federal Registry on February 3rd, 2011. The PREA standards apply not only to federal and state prisons, which are designated to hold long-term prisoners, but also to the county jails, which are designed for short-term incarceration of persons awaiting trials and those serving a sentence of one year or less. Most New York, New York State sheriffs, like their counterparts in other parts of the country, are the chief law enforcement officers of their representative counties and the administrators of the county jail. Sheriffs take seriously their responsibility to operate the county jail safely and securely for public safety and for inmate inmates in their care and custody. We recognize the critical issues related to the sexual assaults of inmates while incarcerated and understand the need to take reasonable steps to prevent any such abuse. Sheriffs know that sexual misconduct have no place in a professionally and morally run correctional environment. We also know that rape, especially inmate on inmate rape, is much less of an occurrence in county jails than in prisons due in part to the short term stay of most county jail inmates, their local community connections, 
their opportunity for and ease of visitation for family and friends. It is clear that many of the proposed Prius standards, although perhaps appropriately designed for prisons, will apply equally but inappropriately to county jails. Prison systems are generally much larger than county jails and they are intended for long-term stay. PREA does not really recognize the difference in the two types of correctional facilities, prison systems and county jails. Imposing burdensome standards on county jail facilities would be impractical even in the best of economic times. The inmate population turnover in county jails is frequent. In 2010, Wayne County incarcerated 1,719 inmates with 55% or 945 inmates being released in the first 72 hours of incarceration. Under these conditions, many of the proposed standards could not be implemented effectively, yet many of the proposed standards would impose huge costs on our small county jails to address a problem that occurs primarily in the large prison systems around the nation. For example, PREA would impose stringent rules which many county jails lack sufficient physical facilities to comply with those rules. Counties would be faced with the enormous and burdensome cost of building appropriate space or the enormous and burdensome cost of litigation and sanctions for violating the standards. The proposed standards which require each jail to collect and report de detailed data and to hire an independent auditor to accept uh, jails uh, uh, compliance with PREA, most jails, certainly all New York State County jails, already have detailed data collection and reporting obligations to their state oversight agency, in our case in New York State Commission of Corrections. Adding a federal layer of audit will only add a, finan a financial burden and will create conflicting obligations between state and federal mandates. Again, all sheriffs recognize that inmates should be free from sexual assault while incarcerated. Washington should not presume that sheriffs will not do the right thing unless they are mandated in minute detail by a Washington rule. Congress should not leave it to a federal agency to determine how a sheriff can best accomplish his or her obligation to operate a safe, secure, and humane county jail facility. <coughs> the safety security and good working order of a county jail is best determined on a state and county level with the sheriff administering his or her county jail not washington's one size fit all regulations thank you sheriff Burns, and thank you all three of our panelists this morning i will begin by yielding myself five minutes and i have questions for each one of the panelists um, ms bender i'd like to start with you you mentioned the epa imposing stricter standards on water quality do you was it just an arbitrary, how did that come to be and what, what is the stricter standard and how will that impact you? I'm not really sure how it came to be, but about a year and a half ago, the town of Marion asked our engineers to do a study about our wastewater treatment plant. It's approximately 30 years old, as is most wastewater treatment plant plants in the rural upstate New York or probably across the state. So we thought we were being proactive and, and asking for an engineering study to see what in the future was gonna have to be done. Um, they did the report. The result was we probably are going to have to invest $5.4 million to um, make improvements to our wastewater treatment plant. The problem is we have approximately 500 users to that plant, and the cost to those users is going to be astronomical. We can't afford it. We, our wastewater treatment plant, little plug, um, operator was just named wastewater treatment plant operator of the year, so he knows what he's doing. And. Um, we feel that the water that we're discharging after it goes through the cycle is as clean as the water coming into the plant. So we don't understand why DEC via the EPA are saying that we have to make improvements to our plant to that extent. And so that $5.4 million, that increase in cost would be because you're complying with this Correct. standard. But Correct. We, we know probably some improvements need to be made. We don't believe they need to be made to that extent. So, and and it, it is happening across the region that, that DEC and EPA are looking at these plants, probably justifiably so, but we would love to do it. We just can't afford it. So, The other issue I wanted to ask you about was the co-funding issue. Can you, that was sort of a, a generic the co-funding problem. But can, is that a specific issue with you? Is it some one instance that where this happened, or what were the agencies involved, and what were the problems? Right. 
first I'd like to say the agencies that we work with, you know, the people are wonderful. But um, a few years ago, well, about 10 years ago, Marion seriously started looking into um, extension of water districts and expansions simply because probably only at that point a quarter of our town was covered by municipal water and people were rightfully so demanding the water. So we started looking into it and we got one or two projects done through rural development. And then maybe five or six years ago, um, <coughs> co-funding was like the thing you were supposed to do. So we would look at co-funding with rural development in small cities. And they, they both ex expect different information out of us via the dual applications. And of course that would take twice the time. It would cost the town twice the money to have the engineers and um, administrators do all that work. So we found it very difficult. Um, we were fortunate enough to get one program funding, but the reason, one of the main reasons that was probably funded is it was a joint municipal project with another town, and they, between the co-funding and the joint municipal work, that was very favorable. But it was a lot of work. From the time we actually start looking at one of these projects to the time we began getting it into the ground, it's at least two years. And people, you know, on a weekly basis are come, calling my office, they want municipal water. We want to get it to them, but it's a difficult process. County Executive Brooks, um, there's so many things I can ask you about from your testimony this morning. I think uh, you mentioned about uh, expanding and the uh, importance of um, the 504 program where you talk about it should be raised from 60,000 to 100,000. Um, just so you know, the, the federal stimulus bill only created one job for 300,000, so um, they're probably uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit um, about this federal regulation, um, the transportation regulation with the street signs. Can you expand on that and what, what's expected of the county and what drove that, that change in legislation? Yeah, and, and, and Terry Rice could certainly add what drove it. I, I, I don't have the answer to that, but, but he, could, he can add that to the testimony. Um, there is a requirement that communities change all of their street signs, their existing street signs, from lowercase to capital letters. And um, there's a deadline um, in which we have to comply with that. And for this community, it, it's about a $3.6 million cost, and we're just one county you know, across this great nation. And what we propose as an alternative is that, you know what, local communities manage on the condition of their street signs. And as we go out and make changes to those street signs, as we have to do, we can certainly comply with the federal requirement. Um, but to just say, let's go out and replace signs, some of which are very new, um, just doesn't make sense to me. And, and, and it really is, I think, when we look at um, some of the, the poster child examples of you know, mandates that don't make sense to me that that is a glaring one because it, 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 it's just a waste of money and, and $3 million that we could put to good use elsewhere. Um, I know that, and, and, and again, Terry could probably add to this, that there were some um, thought that, um, you know, people couldn't see the signs, um, you know, as the population ages and our eyesight, you know, all the, all the, all the reasons that that really just don't make sense. It's kind of an excuse to go out there and replace all these signs when we don't need to. And, and so we, we have struggled with how we're gonna pay for it, quite honestly. So the county would fund the sign replacement? We would have to pay for the sign replacement. And in Monroe County, we are, we are the, uh, the, the traffic department for the city of Rochester and all 19 towns and villages. And so, you know, this is, this is quite an endeavor. And, and basically it's just that from lower caps to to capital letters and, and more reflectivity I know there's some reflectivity requirements as well and and you know some of the, I, I think within the, the mandate there's probably some valuable um, rationale um, but but to just say you have to do it now let us figure you know say this is what we'd like here's the goal let the local communities figure out how we get there and how we manage the resources to pay for it thank you well, we have the opportunity, I would be interested, I know Medicaid is such a significant issue for the counties and what it does to your property taxes. Um, with regards to, um, and I digress just a little bit, the block, does it help or does it make not make a difference with, um, if we talk about Medicaid being a block, block, block grant funding to the state rather than the way it is now um, in the proposed budget? Paul Ryan's budget. Does that help the, the county? Does it impact on you at all? Does it, it, 
it depends again uh, you know we're so reliant on the state um, and, and, and one of our frustrations is in New York State the counties pay for 25 percent of the program and I believe there are only two states left where the counties actually have a financial stake in the Medicaid program but we are very reliant 100 percent reliant on the state making the decisions and you know I'm a big believer that uh, the cost of a program needs to reside with with the level of government that has the authority decision-making authority over it and, and obviously we're working with the state to try and take over Medicaid um, it's um, you know we have property taxes 79 percent above the national average here um, Medicaid is the cost driver um, we did a study uh, my, my colleagues across the state um, there are nine programs Medicaid being the largest that consumes nine programs that consume 90 percent of the county property tax levy statewide so take everything we collect 90 percent of that is paying for nine programs and Medicaid is, is the largest um, I, I, I really that's not a direct answer to your question because we don't know um, what that would look like um, but to the extent that the counties have to bear such a, a, a big portion of that um, program it's certainly of concern to us and we aren't always involved in in that conversation um, here in Monroe County we've spent 315 million dollars on Medicaid since 2009 so it, it, it's a growing problem I spent 15 months on the Federal Medicaid Commission and a lot of smart people around that table myself excluded um, but a lot of smart people working on how, how we can um, rein in a program that's lived well beyond its means and certainly um, you know the federal aspect of it um, you know it's become um, a universal health care program not just in New York State but across this country and we've medicated everybody that doesn't have insurance or, or who is underinsured and and you know if you really want to talk about taxpayer burden that that's again probably a whole different session but um, clearly a concern here in New York State thank you very much Sheriff Burtz just briefly and I know I've gone over my five minutes this Priya, just um, is there a date um, that the Attorney General's office a date for compliance? That uh, not that I've seen yet for the New York State Sheriff's Association. Uh, we've got a committee uh, statewide. Uh, I know Sheriff O'Flynn here in uh, Monroe County also has a representative, as I do for my office. Uh, but we have not uh, heard when it would be imposed. Uh, a facility like Monroe County that houses about somewhere between 12 and 1400 inmates a day could possibly have to put two, three, or four employees on. I would be forced to put a full-time employee on to interview every inmate that came through. Uh, I already have 70 officers and 140 inmates today in the facility. I think it's burdensome because of the programs that we've built uh, since 2000. Uh, also, all the regular uh, audits that we have done. I have a federal team that comes in every January that's there for a week, five people for a week. I have the State Commission of Corrections that comes in two or three days, twice a year. The Department of Health comes in and inspects. Uh, the Department of Education comes in because jails have to uh, provide education to 16 to 20 years old for three hours a day. So we basically have schools in our jails. Uh, plus, we're very open in our visitation. Uh, of contact with family and friends. I just think again, prisons and jails are two completely different systems and house two completely different type of people. 95% of inmates in the Wayne County Jail, and it'd probably be parallel across the state, are released back to the same people, places, and things, their towns and villages. Only 5% go to state prison. In our application, that's only about 80 people out of the 1,700 will go to state prison. So we're talking about a different level of inmate. Is there any provision in that regulation that would allow the, the county jails to opt out? Or is there any any room? You know, it's, it's a one-size-fits-all package, and that's our that's our whole complaint. Uh, obviously, if, a, if a, a sheriff or an entity is running a jail that's not up to standard, and, and they are sanctioned, then they should, should be under uh, more scrutiny. But us sheriffs that do run uh, good jails and, our, and don't use the wall just to keep the inmates in but allow the community to come in to be part of our incarcerating system, to be part of alternatives to incarceration. We should not be punished by a one-size-fits-all from Albany. And again, I agree with uh, the county executive here. If we're in charge of the jail, we should have more decision-making power in how we run our jails. 
Have you been able to estimate the cost of what compliance would mean for the for your jail? Uh, for my jail alone, I'm going to say it would probably be somewhere between uh, probably ninety and one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Thank you. With that, I'll yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for Ms. Ms. Bender and Ms. Brooks, uh, I come from a, a community that has a similar problem to yours when it comes to the DEP and uh, with water runoff. And a lot of the homes that were built were built in the early part. Uh, of the, the century and, and beyond, but wastewater and stormwater. And there's, in a lot of cases, we're seeing where when these folks built those homes, a lot of their, their, their downspouts were connected to storm sewers and the wastewater was connected. So now, when there's a heavy rain, uh, there's a flooding uh, situation that's caused, and, and I know the DEP has, has placed my town in, in a very difficult position because we're talking about a major overhaul of our whole sewage system, stormwater, wastewater, and the implications of that. I, if you could, just to because I, I understand, and I was also had the uh, privilege of serving on our city council and trying to figure out when you have CDBG money that's been reduced dramatically because of the wars we're fighting and other, other things that are taking our funds, now we're working with less. But on top of that, there's regulations put in effect that even further limit what you can do with those funds. I know it's very difficult for small towns. If you could just, as a matter of, of just enlightening, the public doesn't understand, I don't think, the effects of this, and especially when you start getting your sewage bills, how much they're gonna be, how much they're gonna go up, and then our inability to fix some, some problems that we have either on our sidewalks or our streets and our towns because of the, first of all, the reduced limit of CDBG funding, and then again, the restrictions put in place that really limit what you can do with those funds. So if you just, just briefly, and I don't think you can be brief on this. And oh, by the way, Ms. Brooks, I, I think you're being very kind by thinking that these people mean well. So, <laughs> thank you. Well, I can tell you, um, several years ago, we applied for a mit uh, mit mitigation grant um, to alleviate the problem of storm drainage in our little hamlet. Um, with that, we had to change the sewer lines. We had to do the, the stormwater drains. And it probably took us almost four years to complete that project. Um, I went to a seminar before one of the projects began, and they said, the first thing you need to do is buy a four-door cabinet, because by the time we get this project done, it's going to be full. And that's the paperwork that we have to go through to complete a project. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And the cost to our residents, if we have to um, borrow or whatever the $5.4 million and spread that amongst 500 users, it, it can't be done. It just can't be done. Um, we have another project that we're going to do that kind of ties into that is recently by New York State DOT we were awarded a million dollars to remove and replace the sidewalks in our hamlet. It was a, I think it was a 70-30 grant, 70% from the state, 30% from the municipality. We feel that that project's probably going to cost these same homeowners another hundred dollars on their tax bill every year. Our sidewalks you cannot use. The elderly cannot walk on them. You can't push a baby buggy. They're terrible. We want those sidewalks put in and then and the DEC came in and said, well, wait a minute, you've got to fix your wastewater treatment plant. So we're looking at this $5.4 million bill. We want a nice place to live. We want to give our residents a nice place to get. But I don't know how we do it with all the regulations and the funding that we would love to get and have been successful, but need more. So. I want to make sure you have a great answer to your question. Would you mind if uh, Mike Garland is no, our uh, no. environmental services director and is an expert in this? I can talk about Medicaid all day long. <laughs> he can talk about stormwater and wastewater. Thank you. Um, in, in Monroe County, uh, we have the Pure Waters Program to address wastewater on a, on a virtually a countywide basis. Um, in the city of Rochester, we have a combined sewer system. And so when you talk about stormwater and wastewater flowing in the same pipe, uh, it creates challenges. Uh, in, in Monroe County, we had the foresight um, beginning roughly 40 years ago to consolidate um, relatively discrete wastewater treatment plants, but also to take advantage of federal dollars that were available to uh, mitigate overflows of combined sewers into the Genesee River and into Rondequay Bay. So we have a system in place uh, in our city uh, to deal with that. Uh, our Pure Waters program is a special taxing district, so we are able to raise revenues to address uh, those issues. But as it relates to our suburban communities, where we have illicit connections between stormwater and sanitary sewer under the phase two stormwater regulations that County Executive Brooks referred to, uh, 
Um, that is, is an unfunded mandate where we're looking to uh, improve the stormwater quality of our community. Uh, it's a program that came out of the, the Clean Water Act, the same act that um, promulgated regulations associated with wastewater, is now addressing stormwater. And while we understand the environmental merit and benefit of addressing stormwater, um, it is, once again, an unfunded mandate uh, for our community, both in the public sector as well as the private sector. And I think that's the part that the public doesn't often see. <clears throat> because I, and my understanding is, is the wastewater program to start where it really was to protect the quality of, of groundwater. I mean, it was to protect that. And we've gotten from a situation that was a, a concern for public health to a concern of, of public spending. And I don't know how in the world uh, we continue to put, put mandates on people. The intentions, I, I'm sure, are good, but the, the ability to actually pay for it is not there. And so if I can tell you that you have to do something, but I don't offer you any way of doing it, then the, the burden then falls on the people that are paying local taxes, and that's sometimes so overburdening. We don't see that down the road. And, and just just to emphasize that point, in Monroe County, 744,000 residents, we have a billion dollar budget, 82% of our budget is mandated by the state and federal governments. So that's when we talk about mandates, you know, imagine running your business and controlling 18% and uh, the, the overall cost, and I think, Sheriff, you did talk, because Ms. Berkwood asked you the cost of it. That is the, the thing that we all are concerned with, because most of these programs we looked at, I'm, I'm sure they have some merit at some level, but it does go down to the same way we run our homes and our businesses. You only can do what you can afford to do. The fact that somebody legislates it or regulates it doesn't make it doable. So thanks so much for what you're doing, and, and I know it's frustrating, but it just st stick with us. We're going to try and get this fixed for you. Thanks, sir. Thank you all very much for uh, taking the time on your busy schedules to be here today. This was very enlightening, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, and um, the committee will stand adjourned. Thank you very much.